Good morning and welcome to the Institute for Government. Uh, I'm Catherine Haddon, I'm a senior fellow here at the Institute for Government and I'm delighted to be able to welcome you to this event to discuss Peter Riddle's new book, 15 Minutes of Power, uh, The Uncertain Life of British Ministers, copies available outside. Uh, and I'm particularly delighted because Peter and I were just discussing, I, it's been quite a while since he and I did an event together, though we used to do quite a few about uh, how ministers, prime ministers, governments come into office. Uh, I think Peter's the first time I've uh, had the opportunity to chair one of those discussions, so I'm particularly looking forward to that. Um, this event is part of our 10th anniversary program here at the Institute. Um, and Peter Riddle, a former director um, at the Institute and now commissioner for public appointments. And uh, we have an excellent panel here to discuss, a very full panel to discuss this topic. Uh, we've got uh, over here on the left, Lord David Willits, who bucked to the trend in terms of numbers on turnover for ministers and actually served for four years as Minister of State in the Department of Business, <laughs> Innovation and Skills. So you can tell us how that made a big difference. Uh, Susan Kramer, who served also during the coalition government as Minister of State for Transport from 2013 to the election in May 2015. Uh, and then we've got Jackie Smith, uh, former Home Secretary from 2007 to 2009 and held five previous ministerial posts if we include Parliamentary Private Secretary uh, and also Minister of State in both Education and Health as well as Chief Whip. Uh, and then uh, Bernard Jenkin, uh, who is here in his capacity as Chair of the Public Administration Constitutional Affairs Select Committee, a committee that looks frequently into the role not just of ministers but all particularly of how the relationship between ministers and civil servants works out. Uh, so looking forward to getting his perspectives on the role that ministers play. Now we've only got an hour for this and I want to get into this discussion so first we will turn to Peter who will give us a few short remarks about the book uh, and then we'll get into discussion. Uh, thanks very much indeed, uh, Cass. It, it's a pleasure particularly to ha have you chairing it because we, uh, before I left the Institute three years ago, we worked together very closely on a lot of the work of the Institute on transitions and um, uh, so on. Um, it's, I'm delighted to be part of the um, um, uh, IFG anniversary. But actually, the book, um, as I wrote it, encompassed a lot of themes, not just the interviews um, with former ministers, um, but also many, many broader themes which I'll, I'll briefly mention. The original idea came in 2015, um, at the end of the coalition, when we decided it'd be good to capture the experience from those who'd uh, left office, which was quite a few, not just, of course, the Lib Dems, but quite a few <coughs> Tories did, um, and, and just to see what it was like to be a minister. And that was the um, uh, initiation of it. Then, after we'd done that over the course of six months, I, I thought, well, actually, we, all, we wanted to go back and try and capture some of the reflections of former Labour ministers, I mean, uh, of particularly those who served in the um, second half um, from 2005 to 2010, like Jackie and so on. And that actually proved to be a, a gold mine too, because it actually complemented in many, many other respects. Then we decided, um, slightly naively, um, although um, was to say, well, why don't we look at those ministers who stepped down from now onwards? little realising um, the, the scale of what that would amount to <laughs> um, and the complexities of what that would amount to and the, and the number of people um, we have uh, uh, there have been um, has been involved in this um, one ex-minister has been interviewed twice and several, I think at least half a dozen if, if, if not slightly higher are now serving uh, at least until the end of July um, having been interviewed at one stage um, and not expected to get back into office um, so that was the inspiration of it. Um, I just want to make some very brief thanks um, to David Sainsbury, because David, when I, when I was leaving being director, um, we were talking, and he said, well, why don't you do a book about the um, ministers and, uh, uh, on that? And so uh, he's been extremely supportive in every way. Um, the fact that you've got copies is, is thanks to David and the IFG. So thank you for, for holding me to that. And also to my successor, Robin Maddox, um, who was, has been totally supportive of working on the book, and um, Andrew Franklin and his team at Profile. I, I did a book with Andrew in 1993 called Honest Opportunism, The Rise of the Career Politician. You might regard this as a kind of compliment um, uh, to that. Um, and working with Andrew and his team was great fun. So I, I just, just briefly want to, 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 to thank them. Um, within the Institute, um, Nicola Hughes, who's sitting along, along from, from David Sainsbury, Nicola ran the project initially with good humour and patience. 
the patience was required to deal with me. Um, and when I was interviewing the politicians with her or with Jen Gold, um, another former colleague, um, that had to put up with my reminiscences with, with some people um, like David and so on. Um, and she ran the programme extremely well. That was taken on by Daniel Thornton. And it's now taken on by Catherine Haddon. The other point I'd make is when I was starting to write the book, I realised how much more of the Institute's work was relevant to the book. Um, and I'm very glad two of the key people, Emma Norris, who's now the research director, her work on implementation was very relevant on junior ministers. And also Jill Rutter's work on policy successes, which I think is actually one of the most interesting of her many contributions to the Institute, um, and uh, I regard as the totally appropriate uh, counterbalance to those who talk about blunders in government. Because the policy successes is actually much more interesting, and the report on that stands up very well. And that is, it appears um, within... Uh, the book and um, is, is, is quite important. I would also, sorry, one personal final thank you to my wife Avril, who was the first um, reader of the proofs of it, going back to her own experience on The Economist um, a number of years ago. Um, so anyway, that, that, that's the, the, the background to the book. What we wanted to do was capture and say what it was like to be a minister, not necessarily the policy arguments, but what it was actually like, the relationships, relationships with civil servants very heavily emerges um, in the book, uh, relationships with other ministers, uh, relationships with the Treasury, um, relationship number 10, what happened with reshuffles, crises, Parliament, whole series, those are the, 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 the thematic aspect of it. And one of the most distinctive aspects of the book was it, it was it's vertical, not horizontal. Too many discussions of what ministers' life just focus on members of the cabinet. Actually, the interesting thing of uh, the interviews um, organised by, by, by my former colleagues is how it was, it was vertical. And we've got lots and lots of junior ministers. And actually, some of the reflections there are some of the most interesting ones. The other point is, you know, in order to become a senior minister, you've got to be a junior minister. No, not in every case. There are a number of perhaps questionable exceptions. Um, but <laughs> um, but in, in general, it's going up the, the ladder. And I, th I think you were appointed originally, Jackie, because Tony Blair thought you'd been a teacher. And therefore, it was suitable to... I know you had, I know, I know you had, but that won't qualify you for education, um, uh, um, and, and so on. So it's that progression um, is interesting. The other aspect of it is this, which is a, with, with Susan here, is of course, and is, this is one of the few books which reflect on the coalition experience. It tends to be written out of, of life almost, but actually the, 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 the weight of, of evidence in the book on, on the relationships, including from David. I mean, David worked for Vince. Um, um, he was the university's minister working for Vince at, at what is now called Beers. Um, and um, that, again, is, it comes out very interestingly in the interview. And I should say that the source material of the interviews, of course, is all up on, on, on the website. Um, just a very few points about what we actually say in the, in, in, in the book. Again, it reflects quite some of the work Kath and I did. One is the complete lack of preparation, in most cases, um, to be a minister. Um, it is very striking um, how little preparation. And I should put in a caveat there for Bernard's work, um, because even though Bernard hasn't so far been a minister, and we, we wait till the end of July, um, 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 <laughs> is that the reflections of what he's done with PACAC on a lot of work on ministers and civil servants, equally what was done before that by Tony Wright and by Graham Allen and their committees, is one, provided me with a host of material, but also some recommendations which would have been a rather good thing if they'd been taken up. Um, and, and, and perhaps a new government should take them up and, uh, and, and do that. Lack of preparation. Um, too many, and related to that is ministers are not in office for um, long enough. The turnover isn't massive. Now, it's slightly bizarre talking about that now because we're now, we've been at the end of a frenetic period of ministerial resignations and so on. But even if you go back a year, two years, the points still completely apply that the that, that, that ministers aren't in post long enough. Um, and that, um, uh, together with another factor, which is we have too many ministers, if you compare it with virtually any other country, also, despite privatisation, despite devolution, the number of ministers has risen. You can say, well, hold on, isn't there an act of parliament limiting the number of paid ministers? Yes, there is, but they get round it. Ministers of all parties, this is a prevailing sin. Um, Jonathan Powell... Tony Blair's um, chief of staff once said um, Tony would make every Labour MP, I don't think perhaps thought of Jeremy Corbyn, but anyway, um, <laughs> every Labour MP uh, a, a minister 
because of patronage reasons and so on. But what they get round it is by having unpaid ministers. Um, and that is a clear abuse of the intent of the Act, but no one can do anything about it, or whips act as substantive ministers and so on. And that, that, that is a carried on, on the, both parties. The effect of that, and this is something I discuss qu quite a lot in the book, it's reduced a tendency towards hyperactivity, and it produces, if you think you're only going to be there for 18 months, you seize on things you want to do, and um, not necessarily in proper proportion. It also means that, with rare exceptions, um, is that ministers aren't there to see the results of their actions. Um, I mean, David was an exception when he was science minister. Um, well, both Davids were as a science minister, but in many cases th 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 that does not happen. Um, there are exceptions, and, and indeed that goes back to some of the work of the Institute on um, the, the work Jill supervised, which I strongly supported, on the Olympics. One of the absolute lessons of the Olympics was continuity, and it's very, very interesting there, both with an actual minister and then an ex-minister in Tessa Jarl. Um, and her influence and her relationship with Hugh Robertson, um, who was the Conservative who did the Olympics, that ensured a continuity. Um, but that was uh, an exception. Also, there are, there are many other lessons of that too, but they're not relevant to, 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 to here. Um, so those are the, the... So it's not all bad. There are positives. There are long-serving ministers. There's the, if you look at some junior ministers and implementation, some very interesting examples there of IFG work, which I quote... What can happen? What should a new Prime Minister do? Um, first, um, reflect on experience. Um, there's a, if, if, if the new Tory Prime Minister has got a real example. There are an awful lot of ex-ministers around. Um, Theresa May has been forced to bring people back as a result of the wave and the number of resignations. That's no bad thing. So you, you've got some quite solid ministers in many posts who've been brought back. And I, 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 I think give them longer experience... Uh, put them, leave people much longer in post. Now, it's, not, it's easy to say that. It's much harder to do in practice when there are scandals, emergencies, arguments. But it is possible to, I say, by bringing people back to ensure greater continuity of other people in post, um, to appraise ministers. Um, virtually every minister who's sacked, um, um, it comes as a total surprise to. It's one of the saddest conversations as an ex-political journalist I used to have with people. Um, not realising the axe was coming from them. And with proper appraisal, which I think is really important, um, um, on, 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 on that. Um, and so those are amongst the many lessons I draw in the book on that. Oh, just one other point. Bringing in outsiders works to some extent, but can be... I have a chapter on goats and others. Um, and in some cases it works if the ministers are there for some time. In other cases it doesn't work, not least because prime ministers haven't the faintest clue how the House of Lords operates. And so they appoint people um, and they say, oh, don't bother about the House of Lords. And then they discover the next day they've got to answer a debate. And, uh, and that is a consistent thing of prime ministers of all parties. They, they really do not have a clue on that subject. And um, one of my, um, uh, 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 they also assume that some of the people are there to advise the Prime Minister rather than to be departmental ministers. And the classic example there was Sriti Vadera, who was rung during the financial crisis by Gordon Brown, saying, what do your friends in the city think about this? To which she said, it's a bit difficult, because I'm in, in, in um, Addis Ababa at present. Um, um, he said, why are you there? Gordon, you appointed me an international development minister. Um, <laughs> so bringing outside is not the same answer. Um, the... The final point I would make is, um, as Kath pointed out, I'm currently the Commissioner for Public Appointments. You'll see nothing in the book about public appointments. Um, um, that will occur at a later stage, because I've strictly followed um, the Cabinet Office uh, guidelines on that. Although, interestingly enough, I wouldn't actually alter very much um, as a result of my experience for the last three years. Um, um, and, um, but the, there's nothing there on, on that for obvious reasons and properly. If you wanted to know my views on that, look at the evidence I've given to Berners Committee. Okay, um, thanks very much, Peter. Um, we've got so much to get through. Uh, worth saying as well, we've got a paper out this morning on becoming Prime Minister, which includes a whole <laughs> section about how you really, really need to think about your first reshuffle because you get that wrong uh, the first day, uh, then it can have a huge impact on the rest of your premiership. Um, let's start off, uh, if we may, with Susan Kramer. Peter's raised this question about lack of preparation. I mean, how well prepared did you feel when you came in 2013? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm zero would be an accurate assessment. So, uh, you know, you're a Liberal Democrat, uh, so you've lost your seat. 
uh, as uh, you found yourself in the House of Lords to your great pleasure, you do not expect to become a minister. So I'm taking guests around um, uh, the Palace of Westminster, and I just see that there are annoying phone calls coming through on my phone. And this is the day as, you know, when people were, it was PPI and electric utilities and whatever else. So I'm getting angrier and angrier at the stream of phone calls. And finally uh, return saying, you know, who the hell are you? And it's, um, we're, uh, this is number 10, it's the Prime Minister's <laughs> office. So rather an unexpected sort of start to it all, and uh, when I was called in to see Nick Clegg, and he said, Minister of State for Transport, and I was absolutely thrilled. And I said, well, it's fantastic. You've given me an area where I have background experience. And he said, really? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, you know, the appointment only by chance that uh, covered areas where I had some background. And I think the, the induction is minimal. Uh, and I think that's a great waste because everybody then spends six, seven months trying to understand what you can do, what you should do. And if you appoint me tomorrow, I'd be able to hit the ground running. But uh, since that's not the experience of most people who become ministers, I really do think this is an issue. It's got to be tackled. <coughs> and you also need to know how to manage your civil servants. And mm. that, I think, was the hardest thing of all, to realise that in the end you had to take a grip on your office and direct it, rather than engage mm. with your office as if they were colleagues. That, of course, you're collegiate in the way you behave. But I think that's the real risk. One mm. starts out as colleagues, and then you realise you've got to grab this <coughs> one by the neck. Mm. And um, Jackie, if I can turn to you, I mean, you famously had a baptism by fire with uh, becoming Home Secretary. Um, how much had your pre... I mean, you had been a minister before, but obviously very different departments. Has that helped at all, or is it just so different when you become Home Secretary? It's different when you become Home Secretary, but, um, you know, one of the interesting things about commenting on training of ministers, as I found out to my cost, mm. is, uh, after I left ministerial life, is the moment that you say... Um, that you think that there should be training for ministers. You get the sort of headline I got, which is, you know, Clueless Smith says she didn't know what she was doing, and, mm. which is nonsense, because mm. actually when I became Home Secretary, I'd already been a minister for eight years, as you mm. say, in a variety of different um, departments. Having said that, I wholly agree with Susan about the failure of there to be any sort of proper induction or training when you, when you start at the, at the very beginning. Um, it's different to be Home Secretary because you're dealing with, I think it's partly because you are dealing with the types of things that emerge very quickly as they did for me within mm. 24 hours of course um, I was responding to a terror alert and um, interestingly of course um, you then have to decide what your role is as a minister because immediately in that particular case you met the police with responsibility for counter-terrorism, the security agencies and others. Uh, and particularly when you're talking about the security agencies, these are not people that you will have come across in any other uh, area of your ministerial life. So that's quite a quick uh, introduction. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I do remember about that weekend and period of time, when of course you also have to take on your responsibility as a minister to be the public face of mm -hmm. uh, what's happening, uh, was the suggestion that uh, I had been... Um, assured and reassuring in the way in which I'd responded to this um, uh, this terror attack. That, of course, has a whole lot of uh, meaning and assumption behind it. Uh, partly, I think, it was, this is the first female Home Secretary. Uh, oh, goodness me, what's going to happen when she faces a terror threat? Is she going to come running out of Downing Street going, oh, it's all too difficult, bring a man in to deal with it? Uh, and the fact that I didn't do that, I think, was sort of noteworthy uh, to people. It's not the best, uh, you know, it is not an ideal way to have your ministerial induction. Mm. But given that this was a, a terror attack in which, with the exception of the terrorists, there weren't any injuries, actually it is also quite an effective way to meet the whole range of people who are engaged in that particular area of, mm. of policy. I mean, the other thing I'll say about my very first job as Parliamentary Undersecretary in the Department for Education is you realise very quickly uh, the extent to which you are suddenly having to make a lot of decisions very quickly. That's the other mm. thing I think that hits you mm. as a minister. Uh, on the very first day, my private secretary said to me, uh, you, um, we're, we're doing a review of the national curriculum. The Secretary of State, David Blunkett, would like some advice from you about this particular element. And I was just about to go on holiday and I said, oh, would it be okay if I took that away and thought about it for a week and came back and mm. gave my, you know, because I sort of thought that might be a good thing to do. And she looked at me slightly pityingly and she said, 
No, he, he wants it in the morning. Yeah. And that's when you suddenly realise the speed with yeah. which you will be expected to make decisions. Yeah. And the, your effectiveness as a minister, I think, uh, very much is determined by the extent to which you can make decisions quickly and effectively. David, briefly, I mean, that point about the speed of decision making, you were, of course, a junior minister in the 1990s. Did you notice a big change between then? and your time in office in the 2010s? Yeah, I think the change, coming back, um, it definitely seemed more constrained. Mm. And there's a debate about whether those are good constraints or bad constraints. Uh, more decisions seemed to be justiciable. Mm. There was more legal advice all the time, what you could do, what you couldn't do. So what you thought was a fairly obvious policy decision, you would suddenly find there was some legal constraint that mm. you had not allowed for. And, uh, and I remember eventually David, and you didn't quite know how to respond to advice that might be a legal challenge which we might lose. And I remember eventually David Cameron saying to Cabinet, hey guys, you're all getting this type of advice. I do not mind if sometimes you lose a court case. Do not, do not assume as soon as you're warned that you might lose a court case. There's a reason why you can't do it. Uh, if we did that, and virtually nothing would mm. happen. You will have to, sometimes you will lose, and that is not a black mark. So the legal constraints were greater. And the other thing was FOI. Mm. And FOI is a, has had a big ch impact, I'd say, less written down. So actually pressure for more meetings so people can say things that they don't want to write down. And of course, one of the early training experiences for a minister in the FOI regime is the private secretary trying to be helpful, saying, um, how do you like your coffee? Um, uh, when do you want to do the box? Yes. Um, how do you like the minutes printed? And then, of course, that is FOIable. As soon as they put that in a note, it's FOIable. And next, there's a story. Minister demands cappuccino with double sugars um, every hour. So one of the, actually, it's a very good early training in FOI. Don't put that in writing, those conversations. <laughs> then it's the first trivial kind of thing to take the piss. So it's actually a very good early training in FOI. Bernard, if I could just turn to you... Uh, we talked a bit about uh, you know, the, the need for preparation and so forth. This is something that your <coughs> committee's talked about as well, and obviously this is something that the Institute for Government has been trying to support over the years, of, you know, better support for ministers, better induction for ministers. Who needs to take responsibility for improving that? Because uh, we often put a lot of pressure on the civil service to think about it. They do, you know, with private office and so forth, induct <coughs> ministers, but surely it's ultimately the prime minister, but political parties that need to try and improve this. Um, well, of course, you're right. It's the responsibility of political leaders to prepare their ministers. But uh, the experience suggests that if you rely on them, it's not going to be a great success. Mm. And therefore, it's the responsibility of the civil service. I mean, if the civil service wants better ministers, there's tons that the civil service could do about it. Um, many of my colleagues have been on something called the Armed Forces Parliamentary Scheme, um, which is where... Uh, you know, at the age of 50 or something, you find yourself in Salisbury Plain wearing, uh, um, wearing um, fatigues and lying in a slit tent with a whole lot of soldiers. And they say, well, we're spending the night here. Would you like a sleeping bag? And you say, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, um, and the Royal Navy and the RAF and the Royal Marines did it. And famously, uh, um, of course, um, Penny Mordaunt did that scheme. And she, um, uh, she was already a reservist. But, but, you know, she arrives in the Ministry of Defence, consequently very well prepared to understand the armed forces. I mean, she's been armed forces minister as well. But um, uh, a lot of colleagues who finished up um, in the Ministry of Defence have done the armed forces parliamentary scheme, and it certainly prepared them for that role. Mm. Now, the civil, service, there should, the civil service should be doing something similar, and it would be quite easy to do. I mean, there's a certain amount of paranoia about having MPs in departments, and... I remember when we were in opposition, David, we were offered civil servants to support the opposition. Do you remember? We, we said, oh, no, we can't possibly have that. They'll tell John Prescott everything. And um, uh, I think that was stupid. Uh, I think civil, civil servants are seconded to select committees. Civil servants are, should be seconded to MPs' offices. Civil servants should be seconded to uh, the, the opposition parties. Because I think the more interchange between politicians and civil servants, the better. And just imagine if there was a scheme where you could go and spend a week working in a... In a a job centre plus, or um, you were told you were going to go and work on a, a hospital ward or in a doctor's surgery, as some colleague, I mean, uh, Jeremy Hayward famously does, uh, uh, as Secretary of State for Health, work on a ward every, every, every week. And I think that kind of exposure and experience, you know, an MP working in a private office, 
as a sort of locum for a week would be a fantastic experience um, for a lot of MPs they'd never have. But um, in response to one or two other comments, if I may, mm -hmm. um, uh, I think this is an excellent, I mean, I've, I've skimmed um, and it's, you looked in the index, it's, 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 I checked you, <laughs> you're in much more than I am. Um, I, I'm, I'm there by virtue of my influence. I'm not personally named, um, but my committee, my committee is named. Um, and um, uh, I think it's um, a very timely book um, and perhaps you should send it around to all the ministers, all the people who might be ministers in the next few weeks um, to get them to read, and indeed the leadership candidates. Um, uh, I think the, the really, um, you mentioned the, um, um, there, there are too many ministers, and the, we, are, we probably do have too many ministers. Um, we have more ministers than, say, France or Germany or many other comparable countries. And there is no doubt that the pressure to have more ministers is only limited by the fact that, by law, they can't appoint more ministers. There's, also, there's an act called the House of Commons Disqualification Act, which means there can be no more than 95 ministers in the House of Commons. Hey. I, I, no, I think that's the Ministerial and Other Salaries Act, which limits the number of paid ministers yeah. in both houses. Yeah, that's right. But um, uh, you can only have a maximum of 95 ministers full stop in the House of Commons. Uh, but that's my understanding. Um, if you think I'm wrong, please do tell me. Um, um, I'm, I'm a little... Uh, and, and they do turn around much too often. One of the things I'm suggesting to leadership candidates, OK, you've got to make all your key appointments in a rush in order to show you're in charge, but why not take some weeks over the junior ministerial appointments? Mm -hmm. Get some CVs, find out, what their, what, find out what their skills and experiences are. If necessary, interview them, and make sure you're really putting round holes in round peg. Mm -hmm. I mean, the number of people who finish up in jobs, and they think, why have I been given this job? Famously, Chloe Smith was... Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, put into a treasury job and, and, and uh, on the phone and David Cameron said, I'm so pleased you've taken this job, we really need more accountants in the treasury. And she said, I'm not an accountant, I was a management, mm -hmm. management consultant at Deloitte, not mm -hmm. an accountant. I mean, so, so even the experience that's evaluated is done on hearsay mm -hmm. rather than on proper evidence, so that could improve. I think the, 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 the strength of what you're talking about, um, Peter, is all organisations function on the basis of relationships. And I'm so glad the Institute for Government is talking more and more about those relationships, particularly the ministerial interface with the officials, um, because you can bet your life, if things are going wrong, it's because the relationships are bad. If truth is not being told to power, it's because there's not enough trust. And the, I mean, the FOI thing has put, put, put the whole thing in a goldfish bowl. It's much more difficult than it used to be um, uh, because of FOI. Uh, but working and thinking about and talking about and being open about what kind of relationships and what kind of attitudes and what kind of values are necessary in the organisation that need to be shared between ministers and officials to make relationships work. Um, the, um, select, uh, the report we had commissioned, very like the um, reflections uh, work that you do, from Andrew Kakabadzi of the um, Henley Business School, um, surfaced quite a lot of um, what goes on in these relationships. The initial reaction when we said we were going to do an inquiry into the relationship between ministers and officials was horror, uh, that this was intruding into a private space where nobody should go. I think they thought we were going to be sort of prosecuting people for having bad relationships. Um, actually, what's happened is we've managed to get people to start thinking more about those relationships and talking about them more. Um, and I think at the, conf the, but the, at the heart of all this, incidentally, part of the, one of the things the civil service really prides itself on is how it does the induction for hapless MPs arriving in departments. Um, and it does that very well. One of the things we found in our inquiry was, um, compared to the private sector, the ability of MPs and civil servants to transition their relationships to something effective much more quickly than the private sector is remarkable. Um, and there is an enormous amount of mutual admiration uh, between um, good ministers and good officials because they, develop, they have each developed different skills. Most officials can't imagine why MPs are MPs and they subject themselves to what they do. Mm. Um, 
and uh, most MPs think I couldn't possibly do what that civil servant is doing for them uh, if they're a minister. But the really co confusion is, what is a minister really expected to do? Um, a lot of junior ministers are very disappointed that they really have no um, significant policy role, no directive role. They really are there to sign letters, um, process submissions, answer parliamentary questions, um, do debates, do legislation. They are um, part of the machinery, and they certainly don't get the respect that a Secretary of State gets. I mean, if you're in a department and you're trying to get something out and you haven't got the Secretary of State behind you, forget it. Mm -hmm. And I think part of Francis Maud's disillusion with his role as Civil Service Reform Minister, he wasn't the Minister for the Civil Service. It's a trick I played on the uh, leader of the opposition uh, during that period. I said, do you know who the, minister for the Shadow Minister for the Civil Service is? And he said, uh... I think it's um, 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 I think it's John Healy or something. Who is it? Um, um, and I said, no, it's you. You are the shadow minister of the civil service because the prime minister is the minister for the civil service. And if the prime minister is not interested in what the minister is doing, well, the machine's not going to work for you. And I think there's an awful lot of and, and having so many ministers creates that frustration. But the most stark contrast we had Jeff Rooker in front of the committee, and he said. Um, M many secretaries of state are under the illusion that they're there to run their departments. He said, this is not true. You are there to provide the strategic direction and leadership. You're not there to run the department. Tell that to Ian Duncan Smith, and he will give you completely the opposite answer. He says, if I hadn't been sitting in the meetings fortnightly, driving universal credit, nothing would have happened. Mm. Bear in mind, all the bureaucratic problems, the interdepartmental interdepart rivalries, so what is it? You know, I, think, I don't think you can write a job spec from, for a Secretary of State, and I don't think, therefore, it's very difficult to see how you can appraise ministers for their performance, mm. except as, you know, one just knows when a minister is in charge and knows when they're not in charge. I'll stop there. Can I, uh, Jackie, you wanted to come Yeah, I, I think surely the point about the, the training and the induction is it has to be multifaceted in the way that a ministerial job is. Mm. So, yes, you need the civil service to identify for you the sort of civil service processes the you know what's a cabinet committee what's the clearance process what's the submission when you first start as a as a minister what you also need i think is sort of hard bitten ministers who can explain to you the reality of ministerial mm. life what you, you know what you should prioritize jeff rooker famously said at a session that we did have quite early on you know there's one constituency in the country where you don't want them to know you're a minister and that's your own mm. and that's the sort of advice uh, and you know and how do you relate to other ministers uh, and how do you build the capacity around you that you need as a minister so one of the things that i said in the interview was uh, if I had my time again as Home Secretary, I would have more quickly built a strategy unit around me to be able mm. to do the political and strategic direction uh, work that I wanted. And you need somebody who reminds you that this is a political job. Um, as Bernard says, if you are not careful, you do become dragged into the Whitehall machine and the, um, the process of government, when actually, of course, what your role is, incidentally, is not to be a teacher if you're an education minister or an accountant if you're a treasurer. It's to be an effective political minister delivering a political programme and determining the priorities and communicating that effectively. And what you need is an induction that brings all of those things together, actually. Peter? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think one of the, the interesting things is the different views of what junior ministers can do. Um, there's the Chris Mullin view, which is basically paper clips and all that. Then, there's a lot, interesting enough, well, um, the late Malcolm Wicks, who did a number mm, of did. junior ministerial jobs yeah. in the Blair and Brown era, very successfully died, sadly very young, did a kind of counterblast to Chris and said, no, actually, you can make a difference. Yeah. I mean, this is what um, um, Emma's um, research on implementation showed. It depends. Yeah. It depends enormously on the department. It depends on the individual. One thing I'd say in the civil service is, is that the, there is a, a mutual admiration at the level of private office. That it, it, invariably, I've got, I've got a lovely story from Norman Tebbit's memoirs, um, that um, he, when he became a, um, in, in, uh, a minister, had said to... Um, one of his old friends, you know, I never had a nanny because I was brought up in a rather different environment, but having a private secretary is a bit like having a nanny. <laughs> um, and um, this friend rang up the private office and said, oh, are you Norman's nanny? <laughs> and this was a very formidable private secretary who he got on terribly well with. 
And at a later meeting, um, the, the private secretary came up and whispered, whispered fairly loudly in his ear, time for walkies, Minister. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was no problem after that. Now, the, 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 um, the, the relationships are very good at that level. What I think is, is often is the broader civil service as a whole. And one of the things that's come down is a, a view of caution. The, the, you, several of the ministers who did the, the interviews were actually said, I wish the civil service had been bolder in their advice. Um, they, were, they were too cautious. And there's an interesting tension there, I, 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 I think, on that. Can I, can I push back on this, this junior minister? And, and my position was rather a peculiar one in that Vince, of course, was the Secretary of State. On the other hand, I was also in Cabinet. And there was this coalition issue that David and George wanted to have a Conservative in the Cabinet for the Business Department. So it was a peculiar position. But I think that the Peter's book brilliantly shows how Yes Minister and Gerald Kaufman shaped a view of ministerial responsibilities mm -hmm. for generation. And I think there's a danger that Chris Mullin shapes a view of the junior ministerial role. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there are several things that, he, however junior minister, that they can do. First of all, one of the reasons we have so many ministers is to protect the neutrality of the civil service. There's a lot of things that in other, in other systems a senior official would do, a state secretary would do in Germany, mm -hmm. which officials don't do, yeah. uh, and in, we would probably not wish them to do. And if they try to do them, a permanent secretary giving a speech, for example, it's often so constrained by what the department can say, it's very limited. Um, so it's thinking back to my time in the Treasury, any lobbyist worth their salt that wants to come in and pitch a pre-budget submission expects to see a minister. Yeah. And, you, and the, they would not regard seeing a civil service out of it. So firstly, it's because it's the civil service that requires so many junior ministers. Secondly, I think the parliamentary demands have become greater. Mm. Another change yeah, that I know. Because parliamentary business used to be more predictable further out. So you would know that you would be required in the House of Commons uh, two weeks on Thursday. The massive expansion of things like urgent questions which may be a good thing for parliamentary accountability, completely changes the amount of time departments need and the resource they have that there's always someone available to turn up at three hours' notice and be in the Commons or the Lords. So I think parliamentary pressures have, have increased. Thirdly, overseas activity. Um, the, we underestimate the significance of, especially, let's imagine, a post-Brexit Britain, do you want to have a British voice at this conference? Do you want to have a British minister speaking up at this um, event? And it's, I'm not, even, not just talking about things like the UN. In large areas of domestic policy, there'll be some regulatory issue, and you'll suddenly discover that the International Telecoms Union is about to set the rules that determine how you rule out, roll out 5G for the next decade. Yeah. Do you send a minister to Geneva? So my view is we should do more internationally. And beyond all that, again, part of what... Part of the leadership function of being a minister is being there and showing up and engaging with the groups that you represent but also challenge. And indeed, if you want to challenge them, you have to show also you're committed to them. And looking at David, who was a fantastic science minister. So if, if a learned society is opening a new, moving into a new building, and they want you to unveil the plaque, that they're moving into this new building. My view is that the, that the Chris's tone about that kind of engagement is completely wrong. Mm. That is actually a worthwhile thing to do that shows you care about this community, that yeah. if down the track there is some bad news for mm. them, the fact that you have shown up and there'll be 20 people with whom you have a useful conversation from whom you learn something, mm. the fact that you've done it massively increases your leadership capacity in that community when they want you to do stuff. So I think the Chris Mullin picture of the role of ministers is far too bleak, and it would be dangerous if it becomes the new right. conventional yeah. mistake. Okay. Can I suggest a different sort of take on it in a way? Um, I mean, yes, a, a, if you're not the Secretary of State, if this is a large strategic mm. policy, the Secretary of State's got to be on board, so has the Cabinet, the Prime Minister, etc. But there's a huge amount of absolutely critical policy that falls well below that level of visibility. So if I, I, you know, I was only a minister for a relatively short time, and I knew it was going to be short, the general election was coming. So you're limited in what you can, what you can do over that period. But one of the things I was just determined to do was make a complete change in smart ticketing. 
Mm. I mean, it sounds like a relatively small issue, but anybody who travels, this has an impact on your mm. life. Now, it's, now, it's never going to engage the Secretary of State. It's a policy that was about to be abandoned by the department because it was running into so many stumbling blocks. Mm. And you can go out and deal with the industry. Mm. You're not asking for money, you're, but you are trying to get drive and focus and pressure mm. and use your bully pulpit and contacts and whatever else. And to my great delight, I've been invited back now to a celebration of how we mm. moved into smart mm. ticketing. Because only within the industry, nobody else has the slightest awareness of this. So they know what the history of this has been. Mm. So there are things like that. Now, that doesn't compare with, say, my, my great friend Lynn Featherstone, who I think used a ministerial role for one of the most fundamental changes that we could have had within our society, which is to achieve equal marriage. Mm. Uh, so, so there was someone who, who, who used that for a huge issue, mm -hmm. but, uh, but, uh, but for, for many others of us, it's not at that level, but it's something else that does have an important mm -hmm. impact. And she said actually that it was um, coming to an induction session here where we talked about the need to prioritize, what's the one thing you want to achieve? Yeah. And then walking back across the park, she was like, it's that. Uh, and that's what sort of drove her uh, onwards. Through She's that also period. very exceptional as, as the kind of person who can drive things through. Yeah. Minister, just briefly, because I want to get to the audience. Sure, sure, sure. Minister of State is a, is a great job. I think uh, David and Susan are right about this. It's dependent on you having a Secretary of State who is willing to vest the, opportun the, the, mm -hmm. the power and responsibility in you to do something. So I did civil partnership legislation when I was at the DTI. I did uh, an, an, an education bill uh, that moved my second stint in education in which I was given a lot of responsibility precisely for that, handling stakeholders, doing the detail of policy. That is a really brilliant job in which you can make uh, a difference, but it, it is partly linked to this m management of your team point and how the Secretary of State facilitates their ministerial team. Uh, the most junior ministerial role uh, is, I used to call it the salt mines of government, and I always remembered receiving, you know, there's a lot of attending things, which I agree with David is a good thing to do, although not necessarily if it's an invitation which at the top says, the Secretary of State doesn't want to do this, what about Estelle Morris? And then in Estelle Morris's writing it says, ask Jackie. And then you, and then you understand where you are in the pecking order. All right, um, let's get to the audience. I'm sure there's plenty more that uh, people will make in all of this. We've got microphones going around. I've got several. I'm going to go for Nicola Hughes because uh, she was so influential in getting this programme uh, up and going. And then uh, I'll follow with another couple here. Hello, sorry, you knew I was going to ask a question, didn't you? Yeah. Um, I want to pick up on ministerial performance, because as Bernard said, uh, you know, there are lots of different views of what makes a good minister, and that's quite multifaceted. It's quite difficult to sort of formally appraise, but I do think from the kind of public democratic point of view, over the last few years, we've seen ministers sacked for ethical reasons on breaking the ministerial code. We've seen ministers fired quite unexpectedly for falling out with, with the prime minister. But I don't think what we ever see is ministers who, and I'm sure we can all think of some, have manifestly failed to deliver their political programs, who have been slammed by the NAO, who have made all sorts of mistakes, seem to retain their jobs. Um, so I wanted your views really on, on what should prime ministers do about uh, looking at ministerial performance and, and maybe firing on a slightly more grounded basis than they currently do. All right, um, let's get another couple in. Uh, Mark Darcy down here and then gentlemen here. If you could say who you are and then also keep it short because we've got a lot of questions that people want to get in. Mark Darcy today in Parliament. Um, people were talking about the Chris Mullin diaries. One of the features of that was the fairly devastating picture it gave of how junior ministers were managed by the Secretary of State in the then Department for was it Environment, Transport and the Regions. Um, what are the golden rules for managing your junior ministers, uh, especially the ones who've been foisted on you and you didn't really want? Right, great questions. Another one here. Uh, my name is Ian Taylor and I'm policy advisor to Andy McDonnell, the Shadow Secretary of State for Transport, aspiring that his job title, of course, becomes one word shorter. Um, <laughs> in, and I wanted to pick up on the issues about, on the one hand, realism, on the other hand, how you might want to achieve deeper change. And I was going to follow on from Andy's speech to the Institute for Government a couple of months ago when he made very clear that for him, a priority for the Department for Transport would be that it puts carbon budgeting and climate change front and center. This isn't just a question for Susan, or <laughs> particularly would have a comment on that, I'm sure. But I think I intended as a sort of cross-party uh, 
question very much because I think people would generally see climate change does have to be given high priority, but this is not a small thing. So I wanted to ask the open question in the context of Peter's effectiveness chapter, <laughs> which I shall be concentrating on, um, what thoughts people would have about how you achieve that sort of depth of change. Thank okay. you. Great. Let's get going on those, but we will have to rattle through and try and get another round of questions in, I think. Uh, anyone want to kick off? No, I'll come at the end. Yeah. Shall I, do the man shall I do managing your ministers? Please, because yeah. I sort of touched on that. Uh, there is a, you know, without naming names, although you can look at the departments that I was in, there is a fundamental difference uh, in the way in which secretaries of state manage their teams. And I think you're absolutely right, Mark, that if you want... Um, it's, it's come back to the point that I made before, you know, if you manage your team effectively, if you understand what responsibilities you've given to them, if you give them sufficient um, authority to do what they need to do, but hold them to account so you understand how that fits into your uh, overall strategic direction, you are more likely to be successful in delivering the objectives of the department. But, to come back to the training point, you can easily become a Secretary of State having had no person management uh, experience whatsoever. So don't take for granted that people understand how to manage a team in that way. So perhaps that's something else that we need to put um, into the um, uh, induction. And uh, just and to go to the point about um, uh, uh, Andy, and I hope he does achieve uh, everything that you uh, uh, set out. Uh, my experience of, of civil servants is that if you are very clear at the beginning about the scale of the, the overarching objective that you have and you're willing to, to take the time to communicate that not just at the most senior level but you know for example I can remember addressing a, a staff conference in the Home Office to talk about the emphasis that I wanted to place on community engagement and involvement if you're willing to do that I think you can it, civil servants will be excited about that as a as a challenge but you also, as a minister, then need to follow that through on every opportunity and keep emphasising it, because you have to personify it within the department. So, yeah, I, I, if I could pick up on that, how do you manage a radical change? Um, that, I, I think it's more complex. Uh, you've got to have the Secretary of State, obviously, <laughs> totally on board and completely committed, mm -hmm. and that means willing to put themselves in the firing line if necessary. Mm -hmm. You've also got to make sure Treasury is on board. I say that was a lot easier to do in coalition, quite frankly, because we had the quad to use. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so you could get contact and you could get decisions and you could secure funding and know where you stood. But, um, but Treasury is absolutely critical and that's a battle that you need to be sure you can win before you, you, you almost take on the process. But within the civil service itself, my experience was, and other people may, may have a different view, I found some chunks of it were bold, full of initiative, willing to take on change and ready to go and fight the corner. You had to set them going and they were absolutely brilliant. I found others who had, my God, been it through it all before, had a great deal of knowledge and information, completely cynical, that uh, were very, very hard to energize. And if you're talking about the kind of revolution that you're talking about now, you've got to be able to get some changes within that group to create that sense of excitement and general commitment. And then your third area, again, you've got to be able to go outside. You're not going to achieve change like that unless you're working with devolved governments, local government, whatever else. So I think it's such a big agenda, you have to face very early on the level of resource that you're going to need, and you've got to make sure there's backbone that's, uh, to support that change through every level. I mean, two comments on that. And, I mean, first of all, the coalition was different. And, the, and in a way, going back to the quad, part of what, one of the things that Vince and I set ourselves was the objective, that we'd not, we would manage the coalition within the department. We would not end up with disagreements that required they were referred upwards to the quad. So we had our mini discussions on a Monday on where there were conservative liberal issues within the department that we would try to resolve ourselves, and by and large, I mean almost always, we did that. Um, the, uh, some, and also, to be frank, I think part of what in the coalition we were doing was managing our own political lines. So part of what I was doing, 
and Vin was in a way that Vince was aware of, was keeping David and George in touch with what Vince was doing. I did well, occasionally have Nick Clegg ask me what Vince was doing. That's a good story. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but the, uh, and similarly, for, so making the coalition work, it was definitely a, a different type of relationship. One other comment on the, on the role of the civil service. If Chris Mullins' diaries are having a very bad effect on this debate, the thick of it has also had the yeah. 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 the other thing. <laughs> and there's another group of civil servants who fancy themselves as PR presentational spin experts who think that all you're interested in is presentation mm. and will devote their briefs. So you'll get a sort of yeah. poor man's version yeah. of these smart people in number 10 endlessly thinking about the right timing for the press release mm. or what should be put in what speech when, which I increasingly thought was a largely sterile area of political activity, but some very smart young people devote an awful lot of energy to it. Um, but there's, a, there's another type that they, and who see themselves as figures briefing you like that because they think that's what you're interested in. And I think many politicians think that is actually one of the things which politicians have by and large spent longer on and more time mm. on don't second guess the presentational issues yeah. and please give us a brief that's about the substance, yeah. not about the timing and how it ties in with some presentation issue that, us, that a smart official has become preoccupied with. Mm. Bernard, what about this question about accountability and performance? Does Parliament do that right? Do the media distort it? I don't think the, I don't think the media is inter interested in accountability and performance. They're interested in news. Mm. Um, and I'm afraid Parliament is rather dominated by MPs who are interested in being in the news. So if you, there needs to be a, you know, the, the system's got to be much more mindful of itself if mm. it's going to work properly. Um, I mean, it's interesting, uh, listening to David, it's amazing we've got through this 50 minutes so far without mentioning special advisors, mm. who have been, uh, uh, on the one hand, a source of no end of trouble, because they're part of the sort of dumbing down of the political, you know, the worst case, the, the thick of it stuff. But on the other hand, when we looked at the relationship between ministers and officials, um, the, the role of SPAD is maturing. Um, and that partly because I think the um, average age of special advisors is also increasing. The <laughs> experience they have, the experience they have is, is much more important. And they're becoming less, um, they're becoming more subservient again and they are regarded, in the, the really good special advisors are regarded as absolutely essential component yeah. because they are part of the interpretation of the relationship between the ministers and the officials. The, in the worst cases, the special advisors are competing for the attention of the minister with the officials and you've got a triangular competitive relationship which is very destructive and I've seen evidence of that in the past. But um, on, the, on the three questions, I thought there were absolutely three excellent questions. They all overlap and intersect in one way which you may not, um, um, you may not be thinking about that but they're all basically about leadership. And the one thing that the civil service parliamentary scheme could not do is uh, train MPs to be better leaders and, and there really ought to be proper leadership training for young MPs coming in. And incidentally, the more I've discovered about leadership uh, in my role on, as chair of the committee, I think the better I've got at managing my little private office. Yeah. Um, mm. Because I just have learned so much about, um, uh, about why things go wrong. And, and, um, and I would say that the important thing about leadership is, well, there are two kinds of leadership, aren't there? There's that sort of Harvard Business School hero, analyst, big vision man who's going to impose his vision on the company and everybody will follow him or they're fired. That's not the kind of leadership that works in Whitehall at all. Mm. Uh, the kind of leadership that works in Whitehall is listening, engaging and trust building. Um, and you know, however big or small the project you want to achieve is, uh, recognising the junior ministers in the room, the officials in the room, they've probably got as much, if not more knowledge than you, certainly the officials have, and incidentally it's not necessarily the permanent secretary, it might be the grade seven, who's been running agri-environmental agri schemes for the last 20 years. They will ne they're the people that run the country, they really know everything about the subject. They're the people that should be in the room and be listened to. And you're going to disagree with me. But um, I think engaging, ways, and I'm just on this, but building trust with everybody, and there should be a rule for every minister is, about, is what I'm about to do going to improve the trust between me and my officials and me and my junior ministers, what I'm about to say, or is it going to undermine confidence and trust? And if, it, if it's the latter, do not do it, do not say it, because 
without trust in your department, nothing will work. Sorry, we're going to interrupt. I'm just going to make one tiny call, which is actually one of the things that I worry about in terms of civil service, and Peter briefly touches on this in the book. It's not just the speed at which ministers move around, it's the yep, speed yep, at which yep. civil servants move yep. around. Yes. And you do mm. ac find occasionally an official who has been working in an area for a long time and really knows it. And they are so precious and increasingly, I have to say, really quite rare. Mm. And the, yeah, the right. speed totally at which right. they are moved around means that part of the frustration, and actually it's one of the reasons why they get into the handling stuff. Yeah. Handling is easier for a generalist who was doing a completely exactly different area of policy right. ago. They, that's, that becomes the expertise handling because they don't know the subject. Yeah. And I think that is a real problem. Yeah. Well. We put that in every report. Yeah. Every um, report we do. I'm very sorry. We're not going to be able to get to another round of questions. Of course, you may have heard, it's a big day in Parliament today for at least two of our members. <laughs> Peter will provide us with a, a brief summing up and his thoughts on those questions. Yeah, could I, could I take up, taking up the point on um, um, the... De de developing long-term policies, which I think is a very interesting one, the carbon issue. Um, I, I suggest you talk to two of my former colleagues here, Jill Rutter there and, and Emma Norris, who have, uh, who've got some very interesting thoughts on how you build up. And I think one of the interesting things of successful policies is actually building coalitions of support over time, both within my tour with interest groups and with opposition parties at times. So I just want to say that. Um, on the SPADS thing, SPADS thing is, is, is fascinating. Um, that, uh, some sort of servants say to me, oh, I'd love to have a form of SPAD as a minister, because they know it. They know how the machine works. Um, now, it's, it's double-edged, that, because the image of the SPAD is also the one, the in thick of it, etc., etc., um, is the one which uh, you can argue has affected trusted politicians. It's on the points Bernard's been making there. But e equally... If in narrow career terms, um, there's some interesting work which Phil Cowley's done um, on the, what happens um, to former SPADs um, when they enter Parliament. They are much more likely, more rapidly to become ministers. They become ministers much sooner than people who have not been SPADs, and they become senior ministers, and the same is true actually of shadow positions. And it's, it's absolutely fascinating that, and that the, they understand the how the machine works. I think Bernard's right, things have moved on a bit. Um, um, the, the high point of that was in, in the, 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 the Blair Brown era and, of course, in the coalition, and because the number of the people at the top of government who'd been former Spads was enormous. W how that worked out, I mean, uh, I think some interesting histories to be written on, on that. Uh, no, 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 absolutely. And therefore, the, there's a technical expertise. There's an understanding how the machine works, but again, there's a credibility issue. Um, I think um, we'll see how various memoirs are treated this autumn on that. Could, could I make just two other points? One is um, Jackie alluded to, which is the, you know, she gets appointed, is hit by a terrorist crisis. One of her predecessors, as Home Secretary Jack Straw, recalls that on the very sunny day he got appointed Home Secretary um, in 1997, he was with Richard Wilson, the then uh, Permanent Secretary of the Home Office, later Cabinet Secretary, and, um, and the, uh, Richard said to Jack, what do you see out there? He said, oh, a beautiful sunny day. Yes, that's exactly the problem. Um, have you spotted the exocet coming? Um, because an exocet is coming. I don't know when it's going to come, but it is going to come. And the, the, the degree of handling crises, and I've got a chapter in the book on handling crises, which is absolutely fascinating, because every minister gets tested at some stage by a crisis. How they handle it, how they get in charge of it is, is, is interesting. The other thing is the end. All ministerial careers end. I'm not going to repeat the, the cliched Enoch Powell thing, um, which actually was much more about Powell than it was about Joseph Chamberlain, uh, whose rather strange biography um, he, he wrote. Um, is the, the, uh, it, it, it does end. Often, of course, it's the electorate which ends it. Um, sometimes it's fate, um, chance, and everything. But it does end. And um, what, one of the interesting things is some very good work been done um, looking at what happens to ministers after they cease being ministers. And often, often the, adjustment, the idea that people go on to boardrooms and so on um, is on, on the whole a myth. And some quite lost figures who are former ministers. But some will get out at the right time. David goes on to have an extremely successful career at Resolution Foundation. Others, it's less hap happy stories. Um, um, the, the, the Jackie's um, uh, adorned the, the airwaves. So she, she's done and lots of other things, too, uh, on that score. My favourite story well. on, on that is of 
um, which isn't from one of our Ministers' Reflect interviews, but is from memoirs of people who are all dead So by the time we did the interviews, which was... Um, uh, <laughs> no, 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 no cause and effect, actually. No cause and effect. Um, is Ouija board. Ouija, Ouija board, but they, it was in David Waddington's memoirs, which I don't think is one of the most widely read memoirs imaginable. Um, he recalls talking to Mark Carlyle, who's Education Secretary, in summer of 81, it was a reshuffle your father benefited from, Bernard. Um, and it, it, going to, being summoned for breakfast at number 10 with Thatcher, um, to, and at the breakfast it was going to be Keith Joseph, Mark Carlyle and himself. Mark correctly surmised he was about to get the sack to be replaced by Keith Joseph. And he goes in, and there's some fruit out there, and he goes to um, pick up the strawberries. Mrs T intervenes and says, no. The strawberries are for Keith. The prunes are for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that, in a sense, sums up everything about ministerial careers. Right. Uh, on that front, there will be some, I think some ministers will be thinking about what fruit might be out for them in the future uh, under a future Conservative Prime Minister. Um, OK, thank you so much to our panel. It's been a fascinating discussion. I'm sure we could have continued it for another hour. Um, and I, th I think also if we could, um, we will continue to look at this subject again and again, I am sure. Uh, if I could uh, just take, uh, take a moment for you all to thank not only our panel, but also our sponsors for uh, this IFG at 10 uh, wonderful two days of events. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.